Thanks for joining us again, once again today on this stormy Friday afternoon for the 10th edition of your Guide Through the Storm. And actually a, a pretty appropriate name for the day based on the weather. It's Friday, June the 5th, and I'm Bob Simpson, your host for this series of webinars. Today we're taking a bit of a right turn and we're going to focus once again on a question that we received from one of our regular webinar participants. Since many of our clients are private business owners referred by CPA firms, we are directly and indirectly in touch with private business owners on a regular basis. Naturally, we need to address the subject of how COVID-19 storm is affecting and influencing Canadian businesses. Since the main line news is largely about health related and bad news about business, we hope to focus today on the power of the entrepreneur's spirit and ability to not only cope, but also to innovate and prosper during these unusual times. To that end, we're thrilled to be able to introduce you to two people who specialize in working with independent businesses to provide you with some tangible examples uh, to help you to manage your business through the COVID-19 storm. Today, I'd like to welcome Jesme Gwinnett. Jesme is Vice President, National Affairs for the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, CFIB, an organization representing more than 110,000 small and medium-sized business members across Canada. Prior to joining CFIB, he served as Vice President uh, of the Montreal Economic Institute, and he's also served as a director of academic programs at the Institute for Humane Studies at George Mason University. He is an author of a, of a book and many articles published in various newspapers, as well as a producer of content of short documentaries. He was designated as an ambassador of the University of Quebec at Montreal in recognition uh, for his contribution to the development of that school. Jasmine, welcome to uh, today's, today's webinar. Thanks for having me. Yeah, also joining us is Bruno Amati. Bruno is a member of the Wealth Stewards Advisory Board. Until his recent retirement, he was a senior partner and former national leader at KPMG Enterprise, a unit of KPMG dedicated to owner-managed entrepreneurial businesses in diverse business sectors. His core competencies include an innate ability to identify opportunities, develop innovative solutions, implement significant operation, operational initiatives, including supporting change uh, management requirements. Bruno's strong analytical skills together with his high sense of urgency and passion to make a positive difference drives an outcome-oriented approach, which is highly sought after. Uh, Bruno is widely known in the Canadian marketplace and has been featured in various newspapers, magazines, radio, and television media uh, to comment on various issues, financial and community matters. So let's get the ball rolling with today's webinar and roundtable. And I'm going to start with uh, Jasmine. Uh, question number one, we're now, Jasmine, we're in week 14 of the COVID-19 storm that has completely changed our world. Um, can we start our conversation today by discussing how CFIB sees the current lay of the land and really address some of the stark realities that Canadian businesses uh, have faced and continue to face as we move forward through the storm? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Bob, for this uh, kind of introduction. And uh, again, I'm very happy to be uh, uh, with uh, you today. Um, the, the, the reality today is that 30% um, uh, of uh, business uh, across Canada are now uh, fully open. Um, and uh, in in this uh, reopening phase that we are in, uh, the province of uh, New Brunswick, um, Prince Edward Island and Saskatchewan are the provinces where you see uh, most businesses open as opposed to Ontario, 
Nova Scotia and uh, Newfoundland, uh, where you see the least uh, businesses uh, hope open uh, at uh, this time. And the, the good news is um, 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 there are more businesses now that are fully open uh, compared to businesses that are fully closed. And for a couple of weeks, uh, that was not the case. And for many, many weeks, uh, only 20% of uh, businesses uh, were, uh, were open, where 80% of businesses were uh, uh, partially or uh, completely shut down. And so um, this reopening phase is, 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 is good for entrepreneurs. It allows business owners to uh, go back to what they do best. Uh, meaning running their business. Unfortunately, some sectors uh, are far from being uh, on the uh, reopening uh, road. Hospitality, arts and recreation, for example, um, uh, are still uh, kind of far from reopening, uh, but uh, construction, agriculture uh, are those who are the most open at the moment. And uh, if we can uh, see the other slide, you will see uh, the, the, the chart on your right. Uh, if you look at the retail sector, um, at some point, uh, only 15% uh, uh, of businesses were fully open. And today it's almost 40% of the retail sector uh, that is uh, fully open um, across Canada. And so, we're, uh, we're heading in the right direction. Um, other sectors like agriculture uh, uh, remained uh, fairly open throughout the crisis. Uh, construction, uh, if you look uh, on the left side of your screen, uh, construction uh, was uh, closed uh, uh, for the most part around 35% and now uh, over 60% of those businesses in the construction uh, sector are allowed to, uh, to be open, operate, uh, serve clients, uh, develop new business. And so really it's, uh, it's, it's, it's good news uh, in that sense. On the other slide, uh, very rapidly, you will see that since the start of the COVID outbreak, 40% uh, of businesses have seen a drop uh, of 70% uh, or more. Um, and if we can uh, change a slide, please. Uh, thank you so much. So as I said, 40% of businesses since the start of the COVID outbreak uh, have seen revenues drop uh, by 70% of more. So that uh, put them in a position to qualify for CICRA. CICRA uh, is the rent relief program um, that is administered by the CHMAC. Uh, and 70% um, of businesses have seen a revenue drop of more than 30%, which uh, qualifies them for the wage subsidy program, the 75 uh, wage subsidy program. So these are huge uh, revenue loss for businesses and uh, uh, hopefully, as the economy reopen, um, we will see uh, more businesses uh, uh, losing less of those uh, important uh, revenues. And uh, the last point I want to make uh, for uh, a question one uh, would be to say that um, unfortunately, um, the COVID crisis has been uh, very difficult for a number of businesses and uh, ten, uh, uh, many uh, of them are already considering winding down their business and uh, this is taken from our last uh, survey where you can see that 12% of small business owners are saying that uh, they're considering winding, winding down their business. And so this is really the sad part of it is that although uh, COVID might create uh, a situation where some of our entrepreneurs are innovating uh, and finding solutions and way to innovate uh, for some, uh, the reality is that unfortunately 
uh, they won't be able to, uh, to weather that storm. Okay, awesome, Jesme. Now, Bruno, you've had a lot of interaction with small, medium, and large companies. What are you seeing as the major impact of COVID-19? Maybe we need to- yeah. uh, No, no, I, yeah. um, Go ahead. there's, well, there's quite a number, but um, just to highlight a few areas that uh, I find that uh, what this has done is it really has exposed certain um, certain behaviors that otherwise would not have been as uh, as evident. So recent events have exposed weaknesses of many business owners and management. Um, at the same time, it's also um, enabled people with some core competencies and strengths to better leverage them, especially in comparison to their competitors, other partners, or other uh, alliances that they might have. Um, I'll give you an example when someone's talking about working in a business as opposed to on a business. <clears throat> Again, there's many examples, but uh, a great pie maker can open up a pie shop, but that doesn't mean they're going to run a successful pie business. And there's a lot of people that have in the past been working in the business as opposed to on the business. People in that category have struggled a lot through this. Uh, people that are more strategic and are willing to initiate change and drive uh, their business to take advantage of opportunities that they see today or down the road, given uh, the change in the landscape, uh, are much uh, more successful. And I guess later on, I can give you some examples of some of those. Okay, awesome. Back to you, Jasme. Um, <clears throat> when I think of CFIB, I think of the word advocacy. So based on the current state of small business in Canada, uh, what is your advocacy focus and why is this your focus? Okay. Great, great questions. Uh, great question. Thanks for asking. And uh, um, obviously our advocacy is uh, in the form of meeting with uh, uh, members of, of the parliament. Uh, our advocacy work is also uh, meeting uh, and having conversation with uh, a senior public servant um, whose role is to really implement uh, the programs and the policies in place to uh, help small businesses uh, uh, navigate through that storm. But also what we are doing uh, as you uh, as you already know, is um, we're very active in the media. And just to give you an example, uh, uh, for the three months now, since March of the COVID outbreak, um, we have generated uh, more than 20,000 uh, media stories. So that gives you a sense of, uh, of how much uh, uh, present we are on a daily basis in the media. And the business uh, and the, the advocating priorities right now are really those uh, that uh, our members are uh, um, are uh, telling us that the, 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 it, they are the most important uh, uh, items, right? So for CFIB members right now, um, one of the most important uh, lobbying efforts that they, um, they like to see us doing is to work on the CBA loan program. So CBA is the Canadian Emergency Business Account where uh, uh, government back loan are administered by the banks and given to businesses. And so we would like to see some adjustments made to that program uh, because it has proven to be uh, rapidly available for a business owner uh, very popular, and um, and so uh, we would like to see some improvement uh, made to that program. Uh, also, SICRA, uh, which is the rent relief program, is another a priority of our member, and this is where we spend uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, time uh, advocating, is to make sure that business owner who rent uh, their business place can have some relief, uh, uh, relief that was uh, announced uh, already many weeks ago. And, uh, and uh, because of the program, the way it is designed, it's quite complicated and it's not working well. So uh, this is probably the biggest uh, pieces of uh, advocacy work that we're doing right now. 
and everything related to taxes, right? Uh, uh, delaying uh, tax uh, payments, uh, even it's not on that list, but uh, a level of uh, uh, taxes and so on. So really these are um, the uh, lobbying uh, priority that we have at the moment. And the reason why we're lobbying on those uh, as well as the wage subsidy is because uh, we have, uh, um, it, it is our members uh, priority uh, to make sure that uh, government relief programs announced by the federal government uh, are working well. Okay, so Jesme, behind every dark cloud, there is a bright shining sun. And that is behind every problem, there's an opportunity. When an entrepreneur's business is shut down, um, you know, to reflect some of Bruno's comments there, an entrepreneur is free to work on his business because in fact he cannot work in his business at that time. So what have you seen that has been the entrepreneurial response to COVID-19? Uh, yes, great question again. And if we can move to the next slide, thank you so much. Um, so one of the response that we have seen is um, businesses uh, that are members of, um, of the CFIB really started to uh, increase their uh, footprint uh, in the e-world, e-commerce, e-sales, uh, that sort of things. Uh, if you look at the chart uh, uh, on your screen, you can see that especially uh, for the retail sector, and the hospitality sector, um, members of the CFIB um, uh, decided to introduce to their customer online sales and e-commerce opportunity because uh, of uh, the COVID outbreak. And, uh, and, and many of them, um, many of them have not yet uh, introduced online sales and e-commerce, but are on the process of uh, making that a reality. So especially for retail and especially for hospitality, uh, two type of businesses that rely heavily on people walking in the business. Um, uh, COVID-19 has sparked many of our members to um, to introduce online sales and e-commerce. Also, but not on that chart, but also we have seen uh, many members and we have heard stories of members um, saying that they were very proactive on Facebook and Instagram, for example, promoting their product. Those two platforms are free to use. And so uh, for uh, many small businesses, without uh, uh, a whole lot of financial resources to devote to uh, uh, implement a transactional website, um, free platform like Facebook and Instagram can really be uh, uh, useful. And uh, we also have seen uh, businesses um, um, putting out a video and tutorial uh, making more uh, of their products available for delivery uh, and other means to access their uh, clientele. And so um, we have seen uh, quite a bit of, of an entrepreneurial uh, response from our members, uh, although times are difficult, but especially when it comes to uh, introducing online sales and e-commerce for a certain number of uh, sector uh, in our uh, memberships. Okay, so Bruno, examples are always a great thing. Um, and we know that you have your feet on the ground in many, uh, in many businesses. Um, can you give us a few examples of how some companies have pivoted or continue to succeed in the new COVID-19 environment? Um, yeah, sure, Bob. I'll, I'll give you a, a handful of examples, uh, time permitting. Um, that I'm aware of either directly or uh, through some of my other colleagues. Uh, in no particular order, I'll try to give you a, a range through uh, some different industries and, and, uh, 
in, in other demographics. Um, one, for example, consumer products goods company, a fairly significant one in Canada and globally, they've seen where things are going in their view. And uh, they basically stopped all research into higher value added products, um, stopped all promotions uh, because they can't keep up with demand. And they think that future, at least in the near term, is going to be to lower value added products or more commodity products that aren't uh, necessarily um, having a, a brand recognition to them uh, to the extent that otherwise would be the case. Because they, the conclusion is, is that the economic uncertainty for many households going forward is going to be challenging and uh, there'll be a drive towards um, a less expensive equivalent type of product. Um, so they're pos repositioning their entire focus uh, over the next number of years to that. Um, whether they're correct or not, time will tell, but at least they've done an analysis and they've, they've um, directed their resources uh, in line with their uh, revised vision. Um, I'll give you another situation in terms of a real estate company that as most real estate landlords um, do, uh, but they have to, they had to change their way recently. Uh, and I'll give you one particular example that they had. Um, they worked with a tenant that was probably going to go under. Um, and notwithstanding the federal uh, COVID relief programs with landlords and tenants, which just wasn't working for them, um, they decided uh, with some encouragement to get into a partnership with this particular tenant where the tenant would pay all the TMIs and additional rent, uh, but no more base rent. Um, and after a certain level of sales, they would basically become partners and they would share that on whatever agreed upon percentage they had. It was either that or have a business, a company out of business um, in the commercial retail space uh, with little prospect or uncertain prospects of uh, releasing that space in the future or in the near future anyway. Um, that's not necessarily innovative, but it does, it forced them to change their behavior. They've never done this before um, to deal with the circumstances. Other companies are very inflexible and they don't want to change their methods and uh, that's their choice, but I think they're not dealing with the reality of what's going on in, in many areas. Um, another example would be a food flavor manufacturing and distribution company that focuses primarily on the bakery industry, but not exclusively, not only wholesale to quick service restaurants, but also to retail um, in, in uh, store bakeries, et cetera. Uh, they were fine during March. In April, all of a sudden they hit the wall. Their sales went down 50 to 75%, about closer to 50, I think, in the end. Um, they had to reduce staff, rationalize, rationalize away costs, uh, they started, believe it or not, they had the capabilities of producing hand sanitizers, which is not really core to their business, but they did it. Um, and they had, they started an e-commerce site as well uh, for retailers, uh, for retail and the public that they never, ever had before. Although it was on the drawing board for years, they just never got around to it until a crisis happened. <clears throat> so in that case, I say never let a good crisis go to waste, drive the change and get rid of the impediments in, in that. They did tell me three or four days ago that their April financial results were better than a year ago, April with 50% less sales. Why? Because they basically started with a zero based budgeting um, attitude. And they said, do we need to incur these costs? Now, some of it was employees that frankly, they never got around to dealing with because they didn't have to, but many of those employees just didn't fit their business and they, they won't be invited back anyway. Um, but a lot of it was just ripping out costs and realigning how they did business. Um, and they would not have done that if it wasn't for this situation. Um, a kitchen manufacturer, going on to another example, <clears throat> again, most of their sales were to builders and dealers. Most of that uh, did not dry up, but <clears throat> there wasn't much activity going forward, so they could see a, a lull come the next few months. They also went on to an e-commerce site or built one, started repositioning their product line, adding more products, uh, closets, whip bars, you name it, and started dealing more on the retail 
direct to consumer uh, and which they were involved before, but not to the same extent. Um, and adjusted their production capacity to doing more pre-production and uh, some prefabricated stuff. So then when they come out of the, the trough that they will be able to uh, quickly uh, uh, meet customer demand. And that's based on their assessment of what's going on. Um, one last one I can give you, but I have more in the interest of time, is, uh, is a, food, a small food specialty retailer that before COVID was basically very challenged operationally and, and financially. In about January, um, another company that was in the food processing and supply uh, space for retail and food service decided to acquire the small retailer. It was about equivalent size. Um, short story is that they saw the future where there was a trend towards more healthy products, uh, less antibiotics, no hormones, and locally uh, raised or, or grown. Um, and they saw that. Now, did they know COVID was going to happen? No. But because they did that, they were able to take advantage and they're thriving more now uh, individually and collectively than they ever had before. Um, but they were able to set up e-commerce sites quickly and integrate uh, their distribution. If they had stayed separate, this is an example of what happens when people don't think ahead. Uh, the retailer would have probably been out of business by now because they would not have been able to get product because that product was scarce and uh, it was going to higher margin uh, customers. And they were not one of those. Uh, the food distributor and processor would have been in a more precarious position because the, most of their business was in the food service sector, not in the retail sector. Um, so they may have survived, but they would not have thrived like they are now. Um, and that combination also ripped out uh, or rationalized the logistics supply management chain, their inventory management. Uh, they're even now considering expansion in COVID. You've heard of many places expanding well they are into more locations uh, and then rationalizing weight production and it goes right through the whole operation but that's an example of a situation that people have seen the trends uh, and they are trying to take advantage of it now a lot of the things that have happened during COVID are would have happened over the fullness of time anyway COVID just accelerated the drive to get there faster um, so if people are positioned and have strategy and understand where they see their business going and manage it accordingly, they will tend to do better than people that are more uh, in, this, well, in the mode of being dragged along by circumstance. Yeah, Bruno, thanks very much. Every time I attend a webinar or seminar, there's one line that I write down that somebody uh, has expressed, and in this case, I jotted down, never let a crisis go to waste. I thought that was an interesting comment under current circumstances. Now, Jasme, one final question for you is that as we look into the future, what, are the, what, what do you see that are the entrepreneur's biggest worries and uncertainties, and what do they need to do to mitigate these concerns? Um, thanks uh, for uh, your uh, question again, Bob. And um, this uh, next, uh, yeah, this slide uh, show uh, uh, what are the concerns right now for uh, entrepreneurs in Canada, and uh, uh, especially those who are a member of the CFIB. Um, the first is obviously this entire uh, economic repercussion uh, of the crisis. Um, it has uh, impacts on public finance. It has impact on large, medium, small businesses. Uh, it has impact on the capacity of government uh, investors and, and, and mm. all sorts of uh, institution to, uh, to, um, to really uh, um, um, move on. And so, uh, uh, this is a great uh, worry for our members, but also if we go down to, uh, you know, the day-to-day -day of uh, running a business, uh, consumer spending, uh, business cash flow, uh, short 
short-term, long-term debt. Uh, these are the most uh, uh, worrisome elements uh, about COVID-19 for uh, our members. Uh, and also, I would like to stress out right now that another worry is the staffing because with the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit Program allowing people to earn uh, $2,000 without working and uh, earning a thousand more if they can supplement that source of revenue uh, is uh, making uh, staffing a little bit harder for many uh, small businesses as they are able to reopen, but finding it difficult to uh, um, uh, recall staff. And so, uh, but, but the opportunity uh, is great as we reopen the economy for businesses to uh, continue to innovate for businesses to welcome back their customers, uh, businesses maybe to find new ways uh, to serve their clientele uh, in addition of uh, those more traditional ways. Um, uh, but uh, it's, 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 uh, it's uh, an environment that is uh, worrisome for many businesses, uh, uh, especially when uh, they think about uh, cash flow, debt, and consumer spending. As we wrap this up, Bruno, one last uh, note to you is, one last question is, do you have any advice for entrepreneurs uh, to be successful in the future? What are your thoughts there? Um, sure, I, I can give you a few points on, on that. Um, I would start by saying that um, business owners should recognize that others, including their competitors, their staff, customers, suppliers, and other partners are not standing still. Uh, there's a, high, a very high sense of urgency to address issues in many quarters. Um, and then as I mentioned already, many previous and current trends and changes um, are not just going to evolve, they'll, they'll accelerate in many areas. Um, and as was mentioned before, um, not all businesses will survive. And if they, and if they do, they'll, many will be materially damaged. Not all of them, but many. Um, I, my advice to entrepreneurs and business owners is to be realistic and in tune with what's going on uh, in terms of trends and other factors that are impacting developments. Uh, take control of what you can. Don't be a victim. Um, don't get into a mode of uh, what I would call analysis paralysis where you Things are always being thought and never a decision made. I think you have to make decisions and then adjust as you go um, and be proactive on it. And by making a decision also, you have to couple that with having a willingness to implement and execute with focus and, and high energy. Uh, making a decision and not being able to implement doesn't really get you very far. Um, also leverage other ideas of others and their efforts and resources to the extent they're available and try your best to overcome chain impediments <clears throat> and uh, uh, try not to give too much weight to convenient reasons not to execute on opportunities, which tends to be the human condition in many situations. Um, I'd also suggest <clears throat> to engage the management and staff in the business. Uh, they have their own business and personal concerns during all this and uncertainties uh, that they want addressed as well or be able to participate in addressing. Um, so I wouldn't overlook that at all and say that would be very important. And it has been in my experience to engage them or at least, uh, give them, uh, more comfort or certainty as to, uh, what the plan is. Everyone likes a plan. Um, I would also in where it makes sense for businesses and most, many businesses that should do this in my view, don't, uh, I would establish an advisory board, uh, with, depending on the size of the company, three to five people on it, maybe six, uh, with diverse experience um, that are, many are strategic. Some may be industry-based, but you don't, but I would suggest some of them don't need to be industry-based. Um, and lastly, um, I would uh, encourage you to engage your professional advisors. Now, those are typically, given my background, uh, your, um, your, your third party, your external accountants and advisors, 
but others as well um, that can help you not only with COVID programs, but operational cash flow items and uh, facilitating or vetting innovative or different ideas that you may not uh, be aware of. Uh, sometimes the owner manager, um, not always, is sometimes the narrowest person or, uh, around because they're not, they don't have the access to the breadth and depth of what's going on out there. And that's why an advisory board or engaging proactively with professional advisors sometimes helps uh, immensely in that regard. Okay, Paul Tires, any comments? Well, I want to pick up on Bruno's last point. Uh, as, as it turns out, he sits on our company's advisory board, and I can tell you whether it's crucial times like we're in or even good times, having people who can v take a different view than those who are working day to day in the business is, uh, is very helpful. You know, I want to thank our guests for the information and sage advice that they provided in this short webinar. Uh, I have to tell, tell you, it keeps me optimistic when I talk to some of our entrepreneurial business owners, their ability to deal with crisis and come up with solutions and then innovate very quickly. As a consequence, I would urge governments to listen very carefully to the people that are known for innovation in such a vital sector as the private business owners in this country. So thank you for your participation. I think it's been excellent. Yeah, so let me uh, try to wrap things up before we do a brief uh, Q&A session. And uh, you know, again, I also want to thank uh, Jesme for joining us from CFIB and Bruno Amati uh, for sharing his thoughts with us. But uh, Jesme, if some attendees would like to learn more about some of the work that you guys are doing over at CF CFIB, what would you suggest? Uh, yes, um, I would uh, strongly suggest that um, they uh, go on our website and they discover the value of a CFIB membership. Um, we uh, have many uh, um, saving programs for our members. We have business resources where uh, people can call it a dedicated uh, business uh, hotline and talk to one of our counselors. But and also we are a strong voice for uh, Canadian businesses. And so all the information is on our website uh, on how to uh, become a member. But also um, right now our services are open to non-member. And so our website is filled with information on COVID related programs um, um, and uh, other information that can be useful and used by businesses while we reopen, uh, for example, a poster to put up on uh, the wall, a business reopening kit and things like that. So it's a very useful uh, a, a website to visit as we start uh, really to reopen the economy. Okay, well, thanks very much. Now, let me open up. There is a, uh, the best way for you to answer a question is that there is a link uh, in your uh, Zoom uh, control panel where you can ask a question. If you have a question for anybody on this panel today, it's open. The sun is again shining here. So I think that some of the information has been helpful to help us clear up, you know, today's storm. But, uh, you know, we welcome, we welcome your questions if you have some. Yeah. Now, while you're doing that, I, I, you know, for the sake of time and, and the weather, I booted through a few of the things in the beginning uh, related to some of the investment markets. Uh, glad to address any of those as well if you have, if you have such questions. Okay. Well, if we don't have any questions today, it's, you know, this has run on a little bit longer than normal. So I would like once again to thank our guests for today's Your Guide Through the Storm, Bruno and uh, Jesme, and thanks to everybody who took your time uh, from your busy schedules today to join our webinar. Uh, have a safe, uh, sunny, and enjoyable weekend, and we look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Uh, the next one is scheduled two weeks from today, and we'll probably make some adjustments to when that is being delivered as 
uh, the summer rolls on and people are going to be on their way up to uh, uh, recreational properties for the weekend. But uh, thanks again for joining us and enjoy your weekend.